Welcome to the Not Old Better Show Fitness Friday series. I'm your host, Paul Vogelzang, and this is episode number 206. Today's show is part of our Fitness Friday series, and it's another great one. We'll be hearing from returning guest Sabrina Joe, who will join us in just a minute. As you know, Sabrina Joe is a favorite with our Not Old Better audience and is from the American Council on Exercise, where she is the Director of Science and Research Content. Sabrina Joe will be here to share new research about one of my favorite topics the brain, cognitive functioning, and balance, all supported by exercise. And we've got some excellent Fitness Friday news from the University of Southern California about when it comes to measuring your fitness, no one gets it right. We'll answer the question, why it's not your fitness tracker, it's you. And now on to our Fitness Friday news. The Not Old Better Show, Fitness Friday News. An American, a Brit, and a Dutch guy go for a walk. Now, that may sound like the beginning of a joke, and by the way, I'm not the Dutch guy, but it's actually the end of a University of Southern California-led study that could impact the future research on physical activity. With the help of fitness tracking devices, an international team of scientists studied how physically active people consider themselves to be versus how physically active they really are. The research has revealed that no one gets it right. The American responses suggest they are active as the Dutch or the English. Older people think they are as active as young people. In reality, though, Americans are much less active than the Europeans, and older people are less active than the young. Does this mean that Americans and those of us over age 55 are liars about their physical activity? Or the Dutch and the English humbly underestimate theirs? Well. According to Ari Captain, the study's lead author and executive director for the Center for Economic and Social Research at the University of Southern California, it means people in different countries or at different age groups can have vastly different interpretations of the same survey questions. The researchers found that the Dutch and the English were slightly more likely to rate themselves toward the moderate center of the scale, while Americans tended to rate themselves at the extreme ends of the scale, either as very active or as inactive. But overall, the differences in how people from all three countries self-reported their physical activity was modest or non-existent. The wearable devices, such as Fitbits, revealed hard truths. Americans were much less physically active than both the Dutch and the English. In fact, the percentage of Americans in the inactive category was nearly twice as large as the percentage of Dutch participants. You all in the Not Old Better audience know my family's from Holland, so I'm quite proud of this. But when you think about it, reality bites by age group. So a comparison of fitness tracker data by age group reveals that people in all three countries are generally less active as they get older. That said, inactivity appeared more widespread among older Americans than participants in the other countries. So 60% of Americans are inactive compared to 42% of the Dutch and 32% of the English. Again, Ari Kapitan says... Individuals in different age groups simply have different standards of what it means to be physically active. They adjust their standards based on their circumstances, including their age. So, you can't just add wandering around the parking lot looking for my car as another track exercise on your Fitbit. Since physical activity is so central to a healthy life, accurate, honest measurements are important when interpreting and comparing results of physical levels. And with the availability of low-cost activity tracking devices, we have the potential to make future studies much more reliable and give us the kind of information that we need so that we don't make it about the fitness tracker, we make it about the exercise and the right activity. We'll be right back with Sabrina Joe.
Sabrina Joe, Director of Science and Research Content for the American Council of Exercise. It is so great to talk to you always. Thanks for joining us again today. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. I always enjoy our conversations. I do as well. And, it, and it's interesting, too. Our audience really loves these conversations with you. And, and so I'm grateful for your time, of course. I, I want to talk about a subject today that is um, of real personal interest to me. And I think, more importantly, it is, it's, it's an important one for my audience. And I'm referring to this idea that um, I found in some recent research from ACE and it's about this subject of, you know, cognition and physical exercise and how, um, according to the study, um, two of the top three concerns for the population of the 55 plus age community are centered on losing their functional abilities and their cognitive abilities. And I just think that's, that's a really important subject. It's one that is um, maybe misunderstood. It's one I think that can be um, uh, really supported by exercise. So let's talk just generally about, you know, some effective exercise and training strategies for older adults that, that might help in the areas of, of cognition and, of course, um, just, you know, functional ability. Great question. And I would love to be able to wrap it up simply, and hopefully I can with a statement. <laughs> no, no worries. We'll, we'll talk for a while here with these. Events. Okay. Um, first of all, just being physically active will benefit you more than anything else. Even if you look at specifics of um, prescription for exercise that include cardiorespiratory exercise or um, resistance training or flexibility training. In general, just being active, just moving throughout your day is the best thing that you can do for yourself um, as you, you know, proceed through life. But if we're going to get down to brass tacks, then there really are some very specific exercises that will help um, with function and brain health as you age. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the two main things, two main categories are cardiorespiratory or aerobic exercise. And and those are things that you do that that you can sustain for quite some time, like something that you can perform for 20, 30 minutes, maybe more, um, that it's not so difficult that you have to stop because you're so tired or out of breath. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that could be a nice walk. It could be a nice bike ride or just whatever, you know, exercise that you enjoy that kind of fits in that category. Then we've got this whole other category that looks at your muscle and joint health. And that can be called resistance training. Sometimes it's called functional training. And that's where you, you use movement, movement patterns that kind of reproduce what you would do in your everyday activities. For example, sitting down and standing up from a chair looks a whole lot like a squat. And so activities that can be applied directly to things that you would do every day are going to help with your muscle and joint health as well. So the aerobic or cardiorespiratory seems to really benefit brain health and the functional or resistance training seems to really benefit muscle and joint health. That's an excellent wrap up. <laughs> that's, really, <laughs> that's, that's super helpful. So, so I found this term complexity. Uh, related to the research, and is that what you're kind of talking about? That that it there's a a complexity and, and maybe a an integration between the two, uh, you know, the the idea that you need some cardiorespiratory as well as you need, uh, you know, some of this muscle mass exercise, and in that way, that complex integration is bringing about some of this cognitive uh, stimulation that leads to better brain health. Definitely. And that's why it's important to do both. Mm -hmm. And there's one category, and I, we've, we've even discussed this before on, mm -hmm, on this mm -hmm. same podcast, and yeah. it's dance. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, so if you think about what dance is, is it's, if, you, if you do it extend, for extended periods, let's say you take uh, half an hour to just get your groove on, you're, you're definitely doing aerobic activity, but you're also doing complex movements mm. in novel ways that your brain isn't used to. Um, and so that involves balance, coordination, timing, agility. And these are sometimes thought of as 
sports performance parameters, but I would encourage everyone to not think of them like uh, attributes reserved for athletes. I would tend to think of them as things that we should all focus on. And dance is a great way to incorporate all those things together. So that's interesting. So in that way, then, in, in this idea of dance, using this example, which which we have talked about, I, I love that example. Just personally, my wife's a choreographer. She owns a, she owns a small ballet studio, and she, she believes that uh, even using the French ballet terms also stimulates, you know, some form of cognition in, in the bar classes that she teaches to kind of older adults. But in that way, then, maybe muscle mass isn't quite so important. If you are feeling bad about your exercise program because you're not resistance training, mm. then stop it. Stop it right now. <laughs> okay. So just... Um, yeah. So yeah. what I mean is some people will kind of um, view their their exercise programs in terms of, well, I need to go to the gym. And I need to get three sets of 10 repetitions on this circuit of exercise machines that train my muscles. Mm -hmm. And that is good for potentially um, hypertrophy or, or growing muscle mass or growing larger muscles. Okay. Um, and while I'm certainly not going to say that that's a bad thing, I mean, having more muscle mass will always help you, but it certainly doesn't have to be the focus of a resistance training program. And you, you can certainly get effective results by just using your body weight, doing movement activities such as dance mm -hmm. um, or, or calisthenics or, or things that you might not think of as traditional resistance training. And when people say, well, muscle mass isn't necessarily so important, it's basically how you use the muscle that you do have. Because let's face it, eventually there, there comes a time where there's diminishing returns on the amount of muscle mass that you can actually continue to build. Mm -hmm. So whether it's just due to your genetics or it's just due to the, the decade of life. So using the muscle that you do have in ways that support balance and function is really going to be your best bet. Good. Good to know. Well, let's talk about something specific then with regard to balance, which is a big issue for my age group, my my audience. We all have heard about falling, and there are balance-related exercise that, exercises that help to uh, aid in, um, you know, the prevention of falls. So talk a little bit about that specific area, because I found a term in the research, I think it's proprioception. And if if I'm going to work with an ACE trainer, and we'll talk about some of the specifics around the ACE training program in just a second, but if I'm going to work with a personal trainer and they use that term proprioception, and I'm thinking, okay, I need some I need some fall prevention help. Are those two things the same? Is standing on one leg and proprioception uh, related? And if I hear that term, what does it mean? If I want to concentrate on balance, what am I getting? Yes, those terms are related. Mm -hmm. um, and all proprioception means is your awareness of where you are in space. Mm, okay. And you, you intake information about where you are in space from many different senses. So, for example, vision um, it gives you a, a, a large understanding of, of where you are in relation to things around you. Humans are very reliant on sight. Mm -hmm. uh, also, your... Your inner ear gives you uh, an idea of how your posture is oriented, where your head is oriented in space. Um, you've heard of the semicircular canals, perhaps, little structures in your inner ears mm -hmm. that kind of contribute to balance. That's also very tied to vision. And then there are joint receptors that tell your brain where your joints are and what they're doing in space. And this might not seem connected to exercise, but it actually really is because when you're trying to balance on one leg, for example, you're using all of those inputs to understand how to correct your balance so you don't fall over. And the more that you stand on one leg and then 
do different movements like reach your arms away from your center or even just move quickly from one foot to the other. That's actually a form of balance training because it requires your brain to take in all of this rich information and figure out what to do with it so that you don't fall over. And that's all that proprioception is. Mm. Yeah, this is why we talk to you. <laughs> it's so helpful to hear <laughs> this explanation and your depth of knowledge is, is just wonderful. So I want to dive de- a little bit deeper in this area of balance just because fall prevention is such a big a big subject for, for my age group. And there are, in this research, and we'll put links up to the research, there's mention of six functional domains that um, that aid in balance. So could you go through those quickly and just give us kind of a, a sense as to what those six functional domains really represent? Yes, and then correct me if I if I miss one of them. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna kind of, I'm just You'll... kind of like going from the top of my head here. So yeah. um, speed is one of them, and how quickly you move. Now that's important because if you're about ready to fall over, you need to be able to quickly right yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, power is another term, and power is important because power represents how quickly you move a load or uh, an amount of weight. And what's interesting about power is is some research shows that that's actually the most important um, aspect to train for fall prevention. Hmm. And it makes sense if you think about your limbs weighing a certain amount and your muscles' ability to move those limbs quickly to right yourself before you fall. So there are very specific ways that you can train for power that don't, they don't have to be um, crazy or Olympic style training, they can be very simple that will be very effective. Um, and we can talk about that you know, in a minute if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the other domains, motor control, and coordination, balance, mobility, and agility, those are all related in that they use the, the, the principles of proprioception that we talked about earlier mm-hmm. to, to keep you aware where, where you are in space so that you can move like you want to. Some of it's reflexive, some of it has to do with reflexes that you don't even think about, they're, they're subconscious. And then other times it's just your ability to move your body in ways that you intend to um, very abruptly or quickly. For example, if you're standing on a bus and the bus stops abruptly, you want to be able to step quickly forward and catch yourself before you take a tumble. And while that seems like a simple kind of reflexive action, partly it is, but it also includes all of those things we just talked about in that one very simple action. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, good. So Sabrina Joe, of course, Director of Science and Research Content for the American Council of Exercise. Let's talk about two programs that are within the American Council of Exercise. Uh, One is, I know it as the Functional Aging Specialist, and then the other, I believe, is the Senior Fitness Specialist. Is that the right title for that designation? It is, it is. Okay, and tell us about those because I think just as you suggest, we, we kind of need to know who's training us, and in order to find the right person, we need to make sure that they've got some of this information and, in fact, some of these certifications in order to provide that training. Right. So if you're researching someone to work with mm-hmm. and you're concerned about, for example, balance and function, it would be great to know that they have one or both of these credentials. and. The Senior Fitness Specialist uh, from the American Council on Exercise is a comprehensive program that looks at um, not only fitness-related aspects of health, but function and as well as, well as behavior change. Hmm. Because let's face it, if you're not motivated to do um, physical activity that's going to help with fall prevention, then you're probably not going to do it. Mm-hmm. So, so someone who is um, well versed in working with people and helping them change behaviors to support uh, that type of exercise or physical activity is well worth looking into. 
And then the functional exercise specialist or functional aging credential is great mm -hmm. because it looks at those six domains specifically that we discussed in, just now on the podcast. So it kind of gets into, um, you know, both individual and then meshing of those functional training components. So, it, you know, either one is great. If a person has both of those credentials, even better. Perfect. Serena Joe, it is always so great to talk to you, Director of Science and Research Content. I love that title. You have such <laughs> wonderful expertise and, and uh, so much knowledge about this. But thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. To learn more about Sabrina Joe and the American Council on Exercise, or ACE, please check out our website or acefitness.org. And thanks to all of you, my wonderful audience, for your charming, encouraging, and advice-driven emails with show and topic ideas for Sabrina Joe, who will be an ongoing guest on the show. Please keep them coming at info at notold-better.com. Join me for our next show, another great one, as we talk about better than Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>